Lesson from the letter of St. Paul the Apostle to the Romans. Brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, that we should live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. For whoever are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now you have not received a spirit of bondage so as to be again in fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by virtue of which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself gives testimony to our spirit that we are sons of God, but if we are sons, we are heirs also, heirs indeed of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to Luke. At that time, Jesus spoke to his disciples this parable. There was a certain rich man who had a steward who was reported to him as squandering his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear of you? Make an accounting of your stewardship, for you can be steward no longer. And the steward said within himself, What shall I do, seeing that my master is taking away the stewardship from me? To dig I am not able, to beg I am ashamed. I know what I shall do, that when I am removed from my stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. And he summoned each of his master's debtors and said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred jars of oil. He said to him, Take your bond and sit down at once and write fifty. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? He said, A hundred cores of wheat. He said to him, Take your bond and write eighty. And the master commended the unjust steward, in that he had acted prudently for the children of this world in relation to their own generation, are more prudent than the children of the light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves with the mammon of wickedness, so that when you fail, they may receive you into the everlasting dwellings. The saving words of the gospel. Please kneel for our prayer for vocations. Let us ask God to give worthy priests, brothers and sisters to his holy church. O God, we earnestly beseech thee to bless this diocese with many priests, brothers and sisters who will love thee with their whole strength and gladly spend their entire lives to serve thy church and to make thee known in love. Bless our families, bless our children. Mary, Queen of the Clergy. There are the following announcements. Next Sunday is St. Mary's Family Picnic on the lawn here by the church after the 9.15 a.m. Mass. All are welcome and asked to bring a dish or something to share. You can see the bulletin for suggested, suggested items. You can also save the date, Saturday, September 28th, 6 p.m., for a fun-filled evening of trivia, music, food, drinks, and prizes at St. Mary Pine Bluff Gym. It's almost too much to imagine. Wait for more information in the coming weeks. That'll be the se September 28th. If you have any items that you would like to have blessed, please come back right away to the sacristy after Mass. Remember also that we are conducting a spiritual bouquet for our new bishop, Bishop Hying. You can uh, participate in the spiritual bouquet by going online at Latin Mass Madison, all one word, Latin Mass Madison dot org. Uh, spiritual bouquets are a real shot in the arm for those who get them. I know that I've always appreciated them very much. Our new skipper here will probably appreciate it very much indeed, but knowing especially that it comes from from us. 
I also uh, would like to welcome Father Gunetsky, who had a, a, a rare free morning, so he has come to celebrate with us. I um, find it interesting giving a, giving a sermon in a dolmatic uh, rather than in a chasuble. The last time I think I gave a sermon in a dolmatic was one time during a pontifical mass with Bishop Orlino, who was tired and his voice was giving out, and he asked me if I would preach. And so I did. And uh, don't get any big ideas, okay? So, very good. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we hear today about the parable of the wicked servant. This has always been a... This is a very curious parable, because it really seems like the Lord is complimenting this guy who is truly a jerk. Um, not only did he defraud his master, but then he led other people to do the same thing. Now, what's up with that? Well, there are certain things that we can learn from this. Of course, the Lord is telling us how to lie, defraud, and be wicked, right? Well, probably not. There must be something else going on here. And, indeed, fathers of the church have explored these options, tried to figure out what's going on. Now, let's go through a few things that we can learn from this rich parable. Now, St. Augustine explains that what we have going on in this parable is an argument a minori ad maiorem, from a lesser thing to the greater thing. That is, if the wicked servant, the wicked steward, is commended in his cleverness about worldly matters, then how much more should the upright steward be commended? If the wicked one figures out how to maneuver well in the world, how much more should we be diligent in pursuing things cleverly, with decision, decisively, and so forth, so that we can obtain our reward in heaven? That's an argument from the lesser thing to the greater thing. If this is okay, if this is, if this is in a way to be appreciated, how much more than the upright life? That's what we should pursue. Earthly affairs require work, don't they? In all of your lives, you have things to attend to, and you have to attend to with a certain measure of planning and diligence and work and labor. Well, how much more should you apply yourself to those things which will bring you to the bliss of heaven? This is how Augustine approaches the work, the fraudulent work of the unjust steward. So the Lord praises the clever steward not for his fraud but for his cleverness and this is a metaphor for all of us. We should be at least as diligent if not more in pursuing those things which are above. Another thing that we learn from the parable is that a steward and in many ways we are all stewards Everything that we have is given to us by God. It doesn't really belong to us. If we are stewards, then we are not the master. There's one master, and that's God. And we are going to have a reckoning with him one day. It's going to happen. One of these days, we will stop breathing. Our hearts will beat their last and we will die. And our souls will separate from our bodies and we will go before the great judge, the just judge, the king of fearful majesty, the one who is truly the master, who in great mercy and love gave us everything that we have in life and we're going to have to make a reckoning with him. This is going to happen. And so one of the things that this parable teaches us is to prepare well, diligently, for that day of reckoning. If every year, let's go back to the mayor, uh, uh, minoriad maiorum again. If you 
diligently prepare for a reckoning, say, for example, with the IRS every year, imagine the reckoning that we're going to have with God. So that's, a, some, that's another thing that we learn from this parable. Now, a third thing can be gleaned from this, along with that, if then this, then all that one all the more, and we are not the masters, and we're going to have a reckoning. The plight of the steward also teaches us about the, shall we say, the pattern or the rhythm of sinning. It teaches us that one sin can lead to another. If we have been careless and we fall into a sin, in this case the wicked steward has dissipated in a sinful way because he's been negligent and irresponsible, the property of his master, probably spending it on himself. That's the, that's the hidden message in here. He's been selfish, he's probably been venal, and so forth. The next thing that he has to do in order to deal with it is he has to lead other people into sinning and defrauding the master too. One sin leads to another. We think about the pattern of sin, about how venial sins, for example, not by definition not mortal, but nevertheless they can weaken us in our resolve so that it becomes easier then to commit sins that are more grave later on. One sin can lead to another. There can be a pattern and a rhythm to sin into which we can fall, and it almost feels as if we are being dragged along inexorably toward that sin, which is a deception. We always retain free will, even in the face of bad habits and vices and so forth that we can form by our own neglect and our own irresponsible care for our souls. This is one of the reasons why a, an examination of conscience on a daily basis is so important. An examination of conscience that looks not only at the day, but also the overarching pattern of our whole lives, the trajectory of our life, our vocation. How am I living my vocation well in, a, in an arc over an arc of time? These things are very important, and we can gain these from this parable of our Lord. So we have an argument on minori ad maius, if the earthly and the flesh-bound are good at earthly concerns, how much more should we, who have been given so great a gift, be diligent and decisive in getting to heaven? We learn that God is the master, and we had better be humble and do our best, because the time will come for a reckoning, and one sin can lead to another, and before long we can be in serious spiritual trouble. We have to deal with our faults immediately, which means we have to recognize them, and in order to recognize them, we have to have an examination of conscience. And then, go to confession. There is no sin so great, so terrible, that we can commit, that Almighty God will not forgive, provided that we ask for forgiveness. We have to ask for the forgiveness, humbly, on our knees, begging mercy. God's justice we are going to get, whether we want it or not. But his mercy is always there for the asking. And while we draw breath and our hearts are beating, mercy is always, always, always offered. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.